And so we've invited uh, Tim Barton to come and to share with us. Um, you're familiar with Wall Builders about ministry, his dad David, and just through the years, the incredible um, information and perspective that's been put with information that is not going to come through in the school system, uh, the American school system, the public education is a Trojan horse to America. It has been tweaked. It began seriously at a point maybe the last century, the beginning, and they, there was an effort to just um, take every vestige of Christianity out of the public square. And slowly but surely it's, it's taken place. And yet we have been called for such a time as this, even as Esther, and I pray that um, God would give us the courage wherever you may go to church. And, uh, but um, why don't you give a great hand to Tim as he comes and instructs us. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. And I, and I do want to clarify, as Pastor mentioned, I work for an organization called Wall Builders. And Wall Builders, the name has taken a different meaning since President Trump has been here. Being in Texas, people think we actually build walls, and it's not actually what we do. Uh, so the name comes from the Bible book of Nehemiah. If you remember, Nehemiah was part of the uh, Israelites in the uh, Babylonian captivity, and he looked back at Jerusalem and, and saw the nation had been destroyed, and his heart was so grieved that he wanted to go back and rebuild the walls of his nation, and my dad really felt like God had called him all the way back in the 1980s, looking at America, seeing the decay of, of Christianity, of faith, of morals, even of the Constitution. And, and so God really burdened on my dad a, a heart, let, let's rebuild the walls of America, just like Nehemiah. And, and if you remember the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah called everybody he could to join him in the endeavor. And he said, let's just come, everybody live back in the city, and, and, and everybody just do what you can. If, if you can even only rebuild the wall behind your house, everybody do what you can. What they told them was impossible was not completed in 52 days. And so this is where we look sometimes at our nation and we go, man, there's so many massive problems. And it's true, there are massive problems, but I rely on scripture. And what the Bible tells us is what is impossible for man is still possible with God. And so this is where we find our name wall builders. We wanna help restore the religious, the moral, the constitutional heritage of the nation. And as we do that, we do spend a lot of time looking at America. And as we look at America, Every summer when we celebrate a birthday on the 4th of July, there's a lot of people that celebrate, but I wanna, I'm going to start giving context to where we want to go this morning because we're going to talk about faith a lot in America, specifically in our foundation, the Constitution, but I want to start by just showing what people don't know about America so we recognize the challenge we're dealing with. So on the 4th of July, one of the things that is very prominent is people will go out and they will do man on the street interviews to find out what do you know about the 4th of July, what we're celebrating. You guys check out this video. They broke away from England to start their own country in the late 1700s. I have no idea, man. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> what are we celebrating on the 4th of July? Our independence. A little more specific. It's the day that we overtook the South. And it's the day that, um, it's our independence. It's, that's why we have the fire. From the South. From the South, exactly. So it was the victory of the Civil War? Yes. Fourth of July? Yes. The Declaration of Independence was signed by who? I don't know. Just name one person. Um, Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Not? What year was that declaration? Was it 1964? 84? 1984? I don't know. Oh, no. 1864? 1864. I don't know. This country, no wonder this country's in trouble. Okay. What country did we declare our independence from? Help me, baby. Nope, just you. You're on your own. Um, California. California. From. Oh, from? We declared independence from a certain country, which is why we celebrate 4th of July. What country was that? I don't have no idea. You're going to be celebrating, though? Yes. yes. 
but you don't know what you're celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. Okay. That's tonight's homework. <laughs> okay. okay. This is the reality of most of America, right? We love celebrations. We love parties, we love fireworks, and we love food. We just generally don't know what we're celebrating. And just for clarification, everything they said was wrong, right? No, 4th of July, we go back to 1776 is when we did the declaration. So let me just give you the really quick Reader's Digest run through. So on the 4th of July, 1776, is when the founding fathers did the declaration. And actually, we were separating from Great Britain. King George was the king at the time. And the declaration was the greatest breakup letter ever written. We said, we don't like this anymore, and it's not us. It's all you. And we gave 27 reasons why it was the king's fault. Okay, this is what happened. Now, when the declaration was written, there were five guys that helped draft it, but the number one drafter of the declaration was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was 33 years old when he did this. I am 37, but I remember growing up thinking 30-year-olds are really old and they're probably really smart. I'm past 33 and I realize 33-year-olds are not that old and they're not that smart. Right? So the fact what Jefferson did in the Declaration really is very impressive. And I want to highlight a couple of things of, of note for us this morning. So one of the things, he, and, and by the way, we probably know these phrases. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. Now, let me point out what he said at the beginning. He said, we're starting up, oh, there we go. He said, we're starting with this notion. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We live in a culture that isn't sure truth exists. Right? This is a problem because our culture says, well, it, it's what you feel. It's what you think. It's up to the individual. It's so subjective and relativistic. No, no. They said, nope. There are some basic truths that we are building something on. And the truths they said are that all people are created equal, are that we have inalienable rights that come from God, and that government exists to secure those rights. These are truths that we know regardless of what King George says. What's interesting is they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. So not only there's a truth we're building on, it's self-evident. I want you to think about this. Because self-evident means obvious. Are those truths obvious? Right. Obvious to who? Created equal? Do you think... That's obvious in India where they have a class system, right? Because they believe in reincarnation. If you're reincarnated into a lower class, it's, it's, it's because you did something wrong in the last life and you deserve to be lower. In fact, if you're upper class in their ranking system, you actually are encouraged to abuse people in the lower class because they deserve it for their last life. You know, Saudi Arabia last year passed a law for the first time allowing women to drive. Good for them, they're catching up. Now, uh, the husband does have to be in the car with the wife to give the wife directions. So, yeah. All right, already some people are like elbowing, like, see, it's a terrible idea. No, no, we're not going there. We're at, at, we got to let that one go. But it's, it's not a self-evident truth that everybody's equal. It's not, okay? This is not true in the nations of the world. This is not true in predominantly Muslim nations. It's not true in predominantly even some of the Hindu nations. This is not true to every, self-evident means it's obvious to everybody. That's not obvious to everybody. The idea that our rights come from God, China, North Korea, let's name some communist and socialist nations, they don't believe rights come from God. The idea that government's primary job is to protect the citizens. I went on a mission trip to Guatemala several years ago and one of the things we were doing was a building project and I took three years of high school Spanish but it had been a lot of years so it was pretty rough so the guy who was in charge of the building project he gave me a, a list of items to go pick up and he said but Tim when you go take this five dollar bill and put it in your pocket take the rest of the money and put it in your sock shoe on top of he said that way when you're walking 
The police are going to see you. They're going to come over. They're going to threaten to arrest you and put you in jail. You're going to empty your pockets. You're going to give them everything you have. Because really, they're just trying to get money from you. So once you give them the money from your pocket, show them you have nothing left, they'll let you go. Then go to the store, get the money out of your sock, and you can buy what you need. But I said, wait a second. You said, when the police stop me. He said, oh, yes. They will recognize that you're not Guatemalan, and they're going to stop you, and they're going to threaten to take you to jail unless you give them all the money you have. Th this is not that unusual in many places in the world because not everybody believes the primary role of government is to protect people. In fact, I will point out this was not evident to the king. That's why we were separating because the king didn't recognize these. So here's the question. Why would Jefferson write that those truths were self-evident? And more specifically, who are those truths self-evident to? Because I will argue that those truths are only self-evident to people who know what the Bible says. Because it's from the Bible we learn that we are created equal. Where? If you go to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it's where we learn that male and female were made in God's image. Here's what's interesting about male and female in his image. The Bible does not tell us what shape, size, or color Adam and Eve were. Do you know why? Because that doesn't matter when it comes to value. The culture we live in today, we pretend like some... No, no, no. As a Christian, we recognize, nope, we are all God's kids made in his image. Therefore, our value comes from our creator and being created in his image, not the shape, size, color, the creed, the ethnicity, the class. Nope, that's not where value comes from. The idea that our rights come from God, if, well, let's just think about Adam and Eve in the garden. Did they have the freedom of speech? The freedom of religion, right? Did they have rights in the garden? Well, sure they did, and they came from God. This was not government bestowing rights to them. Nope. God had already given rights to Adam and Eve in the garden before government ever existed, because government doesn't exist until Genesis chapter 9. When government starts in Genesis chapter 9, this is when Noah lands the ark on Mount Ararat. The very first civil ordinance ever given was if man sheds blood, by man his blood will be shed. Meaning if somebody murders, society will eliminate that murderer. We're not going to allow... Well, what was the, the purpose of, of the creation of a government system? It was to protect the rights that God had given, right? Because the, the very first right God ever gave was the right to life. God gave us life, and if somebody takes the life, we're going to eliminate that person. We're not going to let a life taker... Why? Because we value life. Government's job is to protect the rights that God gave. All of these are biblical notions. Today... We are removing the Bible, and therefore we're losing some of these foundations. But if you look back at the Declaration, one of the guys who was a professor of history, Clinton Rossiter, was at Cornell. He wrote a book about this, or about history in general, but the founding era of history. And his book was called The Seed Time of the Republic. And in this book, he identified, if you look at the ideas the founding fathers had, there were six main guys who were the originators of those ideas. And when he identifies the ideas in those guys, here's who he says. Benjamin Franklin, Richard Bland, the Reverend Thomas Hooker, the Reverend Roger Williams, and the Reverend John Wise, the Reverend Jonathan Mayhew. Where did the ideas come from the founding fathers were relying and using? This professor identified, actually, the majority of it was pastors. Only two of them were politicians, relatively speaking. The rest were pastors. Today, we don't recognize that. But let me just take this pastor down here at, toward the bottom, the Reverend John Wise. The Reverend John Wise was a pastor in the late 1600s and early 1700s. At Wall Builders, we have a very large collection of historical documents, more than 120,000 things from before 1812. Among our collection, we have some original works from the Reverend John Wise. In 1717, he has a book of sermons that were published. In this book of sermons that were published, there were some interesting things he said in some of his sermons. In one of his sermons, he preached that taxation without representation is tyranny and talked about the oppressiveness of a government that can take your money without allowing you to have a say in what's going on. Well, that is actual verbiage used in the Declaration. He preached another sermon where he said that God per, God's preferred form of government is the consent of the governed, which is what we have. It's the Republican system. It's we the people. We're in charge. It's the consent of the governed. He preached another sermon where he said that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain rights. Again, verbiage that literally appeared in the Declaration. But here's the interesting thing. This book of sermons came out in 1717. 
The Declaration was 1776. So how did a book of sermons in 1717 show up in 1776? Well, one of the copies we have is not from 1717. The copy we have is from 1772. Well, why was this book of sermons reprinted 1772? It was actually reprinted by the Sons of Liberty. The reason it was reprinted is because they were trying to help the people, primarily in Massachusetts, where they were, they were trying to help the people of Massachusetts understand how to think as Christians about some of the issues they were dealing with. And so the, the topic or the question came up, well, well, who's done a really good job addressing these issues? Somebody says, well, well, there's this, the sermons from John Wise. He talked about, well, we should reprint those sermons. So in 1772, they reprinted all the sermons of John Wise. They distributed them to all the founding fathers, all the people of Massachusetts, which included many founding fathers, John Hancock, John Adams, Sam Adams, some very notable names. So when we come to do the declaration, we have been studying the sermons of a pastor from back in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And when the ideas for the declaration arise, it's literally pastor sermons that are being referenced to come up with these ideas for the declaration. Now, we also know going forward, historians have even talked about the influence of some of this. B.F. Morse was a guy in the 1860s who explained that some of the most glittering sentences in the immortal Declaration of Independence are almost literal quotations from this essay of John Wise. It was used as a political textbook in the great struggle for freedom. Now, I point that out only to say historians for decades, if not hundreds of years, used to point out that the ideas that we use to found our nation came from pastors. We don't talk about that, and people really don't point that out anymore, but this was very well known. In fact, on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration, Calvin Coolidge is president, and on the 150th anniversary, he goes to Independence Hall, and he gave a speech at Independence Hall, which is where we did the Declaration. It's also where we did the Constitution, and here's part of what he said in his speech, and the whole speech is worth reading. It's very good. He said, the thoughts in the Declaration can very largely be traced back to what John Wise was writing. Here was the doctrine of equality, of popular sovereignty, and inalienable rights asserted by Wise. You have a president of the United States, 150 years later, saying that the ideas that we largely use came from this pastor, the Reverend John Wise. Again, today we don't see that, but let me back you up. One of the guys who was helping lead the Sons of Liberty was Sam Adams. So 1772, Sam Adams is one of the guys who helps reprint those sermons and, and, and throughout the Sons of Liberty, right, when, when they're doing things, Sam Adams was one of the voices speaking the loudest for separation, so he became known as the father of the American Revolution. That was a major influence he had, and it's, it's worth noting that... I, during the summer, I do a lot of work with high school students and college kids. And any time I ask college kids, what do you know about Sam Adams? There's only about one thing a kid knows about Sam Adams, right? That he, he's that beer guy, which is only kind of true. It's not, we don't have time to get into that. It's not exactly accurate. But the point is, people don't recognize the contributions he made and the fact that Great Britain, the king, actually said the two people most responsible for the revolution as far as founding fathers were John Hancock and Sam Adams. He said if we can kill those two guys, we might can squelch this rebellion before it gets out of hand. He's one of these guys leading all of that, but as he's leading the Sons of Liberty, as they're starting this revolt against the king, one of the things that was interesting is, is he was written a letter that was asking what are really your thoughts? What's your position? How do you guys come up with the conclusions you have? He was writing a letter back explaining his position, and here's part of what he said in that letter back. He said, The rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and the head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. Now he's explaining, why do you guys think the way you think? He says, well, the reason we think this way is actually, if you want to understand it, you should just read the Bible and study the life of Jesus. And then you would think like we think. Now, that's, that's not generally what we know about the founding fathers. In fact, oftentimes today we hear the founding fathers weren't religious, that, that they were deists or, or they were atheists, they were agnostics, they, they weren't Christians. We don't hear that much. And, and we certainly don't hear that they were influenced heavily by the Bible or by pastors. But this is absolutely what you find when you read their writings. For example, if you look at a guy like John Adams, John Adams is a notable name of a founding father. 
Well, John Adams explained what he thought would make the best system of government. Here's part of what he said. He said, I've examined all religions and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. Okay. There's a lot of people, even Christians, who confuse and think that lots of paths lead to heaven. Well, Jesus makes a claim of exclusivity in John 14, 6, that no man comes to the Father except through me, right? But so often we we, we really don't know what we believe or why we believe it, which is why I love this statement. I've examined all these other religions. We have, as Christians, the best foundation to stand on of anybody. And yet most of the time, we don't know what we believe or why we believe it or what other people believe. This is the founding father saying, I've examined all religions and nothing compares to the Bible. But he went even further. He explained, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. So if you were on a desert island and the only book you were going to follow as all the people on this island You only are going to follow the Bible. What would that produce? Here's what he said. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be? If we could just get people living by the Bible, how much better would LA be, right? How much better would Chicago be and New York and Miami, right? Dallas, this would be so much better. Well, this is what a founding father, John Adams said. This was his position. In fact, his son, John Quincy Adams, who went on to be the sixth president of the United States, growing up in the founding era, he actually was with his father as a diplomat over in Europe on many occasions. He knew all the founding fathers personally. This is what he explained about their view of the Bible. He said, with regard to the history contained in the Bible, it is not so much praiseworthy to be acquainted with it as it is shameful to be ignorant of it. Now, That's really interesting, but on the surface, I would kind of disagree. He said it's not praiseworthy to know the Bible. Pause. I think it's very praiseworthy to know the Bible, right? In fact, that's one of the reasons we appreciate pastor, right? And and different spiritual leaders in our life, because when they know the word and can explain the word and and here's our position and here, we appreciate that's praiseworthy, So why would would John Quincy Adams say it wasn't praiseworthy? Well, understand the context of the culture in which they live. If in this room, we had a a quick survey and I said, okay, what's two plus two? Hopefully it's not a trick question and everybody knows it's four. It's not impressive that you knew it was four because it's not impressive that you know what should be obvious to everybody. Everybody. But it would be shameful for you not to know two plus two was four. This is the context of the culture in which they live. The number one book people used to learn to read in early America was the Bible. Therefore, everybody, even if you didn't believe Jesus was a son of God, you still knew what the Bible said. Because it's what you learned to read with. And this is what he's saying. It's not impressive to know the Bible because everybody knows the Bible. But if you don't, it would be shameful. This is the context of the culture in which they grew up, in which he lived. And this is, again, where today people don't recognize how much faith played a role in the founding fathers because we don't know who they were or study their writings. Teddy Roosevelt, not a founding father many years later, but also a president. Teddy Roosevelt talked about the influence of the Bible. He said, the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our civic and social life that it would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if these teachings were removed. Most people today cannot identify how the Bible shaped America. We we don't know. But if we go back and start looking, the reason we have the rights of conscience, the reason we have religious liberty— the reason we have a Republican form of government, the reason we have the free market system, the reason we had public school education, the reason we have actually as a nation, the reason we're the most charitable nation in the history of the world, you can go through a list of things that is unique in America. And the only reason we've done those things has been because of the influence of the Bible. What he says is the teachings of the Bible have been intertwined with our civic and our social life. Notice he didn't say the Bible shaped the spiritual climate of America. Civic government affairs, politics, our social life, all of our interactions with people. The Bible has so shaped it, 
It would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if the teachings were removed. What he means is if you remove the Bible, you would not recognize America because everything we do has been shaped by the Bible. This is what President Teddy Roosevelt acknowledged. Go forward to FDR. President FDR, also talking about the Bible, said in the formative days of the Republic, the directing influence the Bible exercised upon the fathers of the nation is conspicuously evident. That means it's obvious. He says it's obvious the founding fathers were shaped by the Bible. Everybody knows that. Well, it's not obvious anymore, but it used to be obvious is what he's saying. He continued, we cannot read the history of our rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible is occupied in shaping the advances of the Republic. He said, you can't even read a history book and not see how the Bible shaped America. You can read almost any history book today and you would not see how the Bible shaped America. This is back in the 1940s. This is not that long ago. What have we forgotten that, that used to be well known and documented? And this is where we just don't know very much history anymore and we don't know the Bible very well. So we don't know history to know how they use the Bible. But even if we studied history, if you don't know the Bible, you don't recognize how often they quote or cite or use the Bible. Let me give you an example. Benjamin Franklin is considered today to be one of the least religious founding fathers. And I would agree. He was one of the least religious. Least religious doesn't mean anti-religious, which is worth noting. Benjamin Franklin was one of six guys who signed both the Declaration and the Constitution. At the Constitutional Convention, if you remember from history, they were having really a lot of tough struggles at the very beginning. The first several weeks, nothing was getting done. And largely because as the different states sent delegates to represent their state, most states had their own proposals for how our nation should function. And so New York had a plan and nobody else liked it except New York. And New Jersey had a plan and nobody else liked it except New Jersey. Virginia had a plan. Nobody liked anybody else's plan. So I know this is going to shock you, but back then the politicians didn't get along. And so they just argued for four and a half weeks. All that it was argue. It got so bad that some of the delegates started getting up and leaving saying, why are we here arguing this? This is never going to work. It's never going to happen. We're too frustrated. It was reported that George Washington, who's up here on the right, actually got out, chased down some of the Virginia delegates. One of them was George Mason. He was in a carriage and George Washington was reported, ran alongside the carriage and said, Mason, you, you, you can't leave. You can't give up. We fought a revolution to become a nation. We've given too much. You, you, you got to give it one more chance. In respect for Washington, the delegate stayed. In the midst of their frustration, Benjamin Franklin, who was the old man of the convention, he got up and gave the longest speech he gave. It was on June 28, 1787, and it was his proposed solution to all of their problems. Here is what the least religious founding father suggested they should do to solve their problems. He said to the assembly, in this situation, this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish and present it to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Now, this is the least religious founding father saying, guys, why hasn't anybody thought of praying? We should ask God for help. He continued. He said, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. He's remembering back to the middle of the revolution. He said, guys, remember, we were, we were in this Independence Hall, which is where they are now for the Constitution, is where they were when they did the Declaration. He said, guys, we prayed every single day for God's help. He said, our prayers were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire could rise without his aid? We have been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. And I also believe without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel, and we shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth, 
prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Now, that's the least religious founding father. Okay? But let me ask you something that I think is a little deeper thought. I just read 14 sentences from his speech. His speech is a little longer, but I chose those 14 sentences for a reason. If you are presumably a Christian, if not, I'd love to tell you about Jesus later, but if you're a Christian, we say we base our life on the Bible. So if you base your life on the Bible, let me ask you a Bible question. In those 14 sentences I read, how many Bible verses did you recognize? Now, I don't need a guess number, but I want you to think about it. Now, the reason I want you to guess is because if you're right, I don't want you to be filled with pride. And if you're wrong, it's embarrassing. So just think about it, right? But in 14 sentences, he quoted or referenced 14 verses. And here's what's significant. Benjamin Franklin was not somebody making an appeal to turn and trust your life to Jesus Christ. He was making an appeal to prayer. But notice, as he's making this appeal, he's quoting the Bible an awful lot. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? It can't come out of you if you didn't put it in you. This is the founding fathers. This is why FDR said you can't read history and not see how the Bible shaped the founding fathers. Well, that's only true if you read history and if you know the Bible. But if you read history and know the Bible, you will find hundreds of moments like that where you see the Bible influencing America. Now, after Franklin's call to prayer, George Washington reports they actually took three days off and they didn't call in a chaplain for like five or six days, but they took three days off. It was a weekend. They were coming up on the 4th of July and George Washington in his journal said for those three days off, they actually went to church for three days. And at church, they brought in a pastor, the Reverend William uh, who, Rogers, who led them for three days in prayer and spiritual orations. And at the end of those three days, they came back and there was one delegate who reported when they came back, he said the entire atmosphere changed. Where there had been a spirit of division, that there now was a spirit of peace and unity and they were able to get along and start getting things done. Now, when they got together over the next several weeks, they wrote what has become the most successful governing document in the history of the world. I don't say this lightly, the world average for constitutions is 17 years. Ours is 232 years old, okay? It has been literally the most successful governing document in the history of the world. What's interesting though, is when you start reading the founders' writings, and they talk about where did these ideas come from, what you will discover is an awful lot of things we have in the Constitution came directly from Scripture or things in the Constitution we said we will not do this in America. Well, guess what? It was also forbidden in the Bible. And you see this, in fact, separation of powers. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, and John Adams all four wrote in letters. The reason we had to separate was now they quoted they said is because the heart is wicked and deceitful and it can't be trusted therefore we can't centralize power we have to separate power and this is significant because none of them said jeremiah 17 9 today if somebody doesn't give us the reference we don't always know what they're talking about but the founding fathers often quoted scripture and didn't give reference why because they expected everybody knew what they were talking about right I, I probably shouldn't have to tell you if we said, right, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, I, I probably shouldn't have to tell you it's John three sixteen because probably we all should know that. This was the idea. Just because they didn't write the reference doesn't mean they weren't quoting the Bible because where else do you find that the heart of man is wicked and deceitful and can't be trusted? I will contend it's only in Jeremiah 17, 9, right? But, but this is what you find in their writings. They explain the reason they did the things they did. And this is why even years after the founding fathers, you have people like President Andrew Jackson, who was not a really good guy in a lot of areas in his life, was arguably one of the least religious presidents we've had in our nation's history. And yet even Andrew Jackson acknowledged, he said, the Bible is the rock upon which our republic rests. The Bible was the foundation upon which we built our nation. This is what was largely known. And if you go back to the Declaration, let me just back up and then we'll walk forward again. At the Declaration, 
There were 56 guys that signed the declaration. Today, I hear people argue that they were atheists, agnostics, and deists. Here's the problem with that. Of those 56 signers, you have people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, that is, oh, come on, brain, he's got glasses, James Wilson, wow. And, and then uh, Benjamin Rush, are those five guys, all of them said that their ideas came largely from John Locke's two treatises of government. Richard Henry Lee says that the declaration was largely just copied from John Locke's two treatises of government. John Locke was a political philosopher, but he also was a very strong Christian and religious philosopher. His two treatises of government were written in opposition. There was a royal official in England who wrote in defense of the divine right of kings. And in writing about the divine right of kings, this official said that God has always had kings. In fact, if you read in Genesis, Adam was the very first king in the Bible. Adam's sons were kings. God loves kings. In fact, God loves our king and you should love the king too. This is what the royal official said. John Locke writes a rebuttal. It was in his first treatise and then there was a second treatise. Okay, so this is a com combination of two treatises. But his first treatise was the, the, largely the rebuttal of this. And in this rebuttal, I mean, essentially he says, this is the worst exegesis of scripture ever, right? And then he starts in Genesis 1, and John Locke in this first treatise goes through verse after verse after verse after verse. In fact, when you go through the two treatises, he quotes more than 1,500 verses on the way God's original intent was, the design was, and the way government was supposed to function. 1,500 Bible verses, and the founding father said that that was the basis for which we did the declaration. This is again a moment when it becomes very evident that the Bible was the foundation upon which our nation was largely built. Well, go forward to the Constitution because people, some people will say, okay, we know there was religion around the Declaration, but we live under the Constitution. The Constitution wasn't religious. Okay, well, let's just talk about the Constitution. At the Constitutional Convention, when these guys are discussing and debating all they're doing, there was a group of professors who thought, it would be really neat if we could see where they got their ideas from. And so these professors went through 15,000 of these founding father writings, all guys who were there at the Constitutional Convention, went through 15,000 writings, and they found nearly 4,000 quotes that were used in these 15,000 writings. And then they said, we need to find where these 4,000 quotes came from. It took them more than 10 years to document all of these quotes and at the end of which, they, and by the way, the book is called The Origins of American Constitutionalism. Is if you want to read this book, and, and really they do a very good job explaining and laying this out. But what they point out is the number one cited individual was Montesquieu, 8.3%. And he did, he wrote on laws, and, and so there was a heavy reliance on Montesquieu. But it was 8.3% of the quotes coming in second place was William Blackstone. He did Blackstone's Commentaries and Laws of England, 7.9%. Third place was John Locke. Now, John Locke was, they say, was the most quoted during the American Revolution. But they're looking at roughly a 60-year period. So that's the first, second, and third most cited individuals. But they said it's not the top cited source. The number one cited source was the Bible. 34% of all the quotes they found came from the Bible. That's four times more than the most cited individual was the Bible. So when we talk about the Bible shaping our nation or even shaping the Constitution, this is largely seen. The problem is today, people, people don't see the connection from the Bible. And again, I would argue it's because we don't know history and we don't know the Bible very well. Because even if we started reading some of the founders' writings, which sometimes is not always fun, it's tough reading, right? Not always entertaining. They weren't always good storytellers. But if you start reading their writings, if you don't know the Bible, you wouldn't recognize how much they're quoting the Bible. And this is where when we start looking back through history, one of the things, if you go back, just for example, go back in the story of the Israelites, okay? Go all the way back to the beginning when you have uh, the end of Genesis, this is when Joseph is, right, a ruler second only to Pharaoh, and he brings all the family in. Well, then Exodus picks up, it's 400 years later, and there's now a Pharaoh who doesn't remember Joseph, doesn't know the family. Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and as it goes through, Moses is, is raised up by God to come in and be the deliverer, right? As Moses is brought in as a deliverer, God says he's going to do these, these signs and wonders, and there's, there's 10 plagues that are done. It's interesting as you read in Exodus about this, that when, when the blood miracle happens, right? Now the blood, 
Pharaoh calls the magicians. And the magicians say, we can turn water to blood, and they did it. So Pharaoh's not impressed. He hardens his heart. God says, all right, I got something else for you. So we then have the frogs. Swarms, plagues, whatever it is, right? Just overrunning with frogs. Pharaoh calls his magicians. They say, we can make frogs. Frogs show up. He hardens his heart. Third one, God says, all right, I got something else for you. Then there was lice. What's interesting about this is lice is where you see something very different in Exodus. Because when Pharaoh calls in his magicians, the magicians say, okay, we have no idea how they did this. This one is beyond us. In fact, here's what they said. All the dust of the earth became lice through all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth lice. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. That's not something we can do. That had to have come from God. Okay? And that's what you see, even going forward to the next plagues, that this was something nobody could replicate. This had to be God. Well, this idea of the finger of God is found throughout Scripture. In fact, when it comes time for the Ten Commandments, we know the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God, as is explained in more than one place. But you find it in Exodus. When God had finished speaking with Moses upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablet of stone, written by the finger of God. Okay, so we see the finger of God again. You can go forward in the Old Testament in Daniel 5. This is when, uh, right when they're having this big feast and they call for the golden goblets to be brought out that were part of the temple. And this giant hand appears and writes, meeny, meeny, tackle you farson on the wall. Right, they call on Daniel, gives the interpretation. But you see again, the finger of God used in scripture. Then you have a moment when Jesus was doing miracles and, and the disciples we're actually being accosted by Pharisees and, and you're casting out with, with the authority of the devil. And, and what Jesus says, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Notice finger of God is something that you see quite often through scripture. And every time you see the finger of God mentioned in scripture, it represents the power and authority of God, something man could not do. This had to come from God. The reason I point that out is it's a, we have to have this biblical understanding because I'm going to read you a few things from Founding Fathers, but I want to set up the context first. So, of the Founding Fathers who were there at the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton is one of the guys who was there, ends up being one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. But Alexander Hamilton wrote about his view of how we were able to accomplish the Constitution. Here's what he said. For my own part, I sincerely esteem the Constitution a system which, without the finger of God, never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interest. Notice he says it was the finger of God that helped us do the Constitution. Where did you come up with the idea of the finger of God? Well, well, certainly you see it in Scripture, right? This isn't something that you just originated for your own creative thoughts, but it's also recognizing that they understood we had God's help in doing this. That's Alexander Hamilton. Well, James Madison today, he's known as the father of the Constitution. Well, James Madison said something very similar. James Madison talking about the Constitution, he says... The real wonder is that the Constitutional Convention overcame so many difficulties and to overcome them with so much agreement was as unprecedented as it was unexpected. It is impossible for the pious man not to recognize in it a finger of that almighty hand which was so frequently extended to us in the critical stage of the revolution. So he's acknowledging during the revolution, God helped us, but he also points out in the Constitution, it was a finger of that almighty hand. Well, let's not stop there because we have many more examples. George Washington Today, a lot of people argue he was a deist. Now, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. He was not a deist, but people argue that today. Well, George Washington, also about the Constitution, wrote this. He said, As to my sentiments with respect to the new Constitution, it appears to me little short of a miracle. It demonstrates as visibly the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate. Okay. Again, recognizing the finger of God, but George Washington even said, I think it's probably a miracle that this happened. Well, a deist doesn't believe God gets involved in the world, much less would do a miracle to intervene on behalf of people in the world. But the founding fathers recognized that this was something special. The Constitution was something unique that God, they believed God had helped them do this. Benjamin Franklin, one of those guys who also was there, Benjamin Franklin has some unique sentiments about this, which are really strong. 
He said, I beg I may not be understood to infer that our general convention was divinely inspired when it formed the new federal constitution. Yet I must own I have so much faith in the general government of the world by providence that I can hardly conceive a transaction of such momentous importance should be suffered to pass without being influenced, guided, and governed by that omnipotent, omnipresent, and beneficent ruler in whom all inferior spirits live and move and have their being. Now, again, this is the least religious founding father recognizing, he says, I think God really helped us do this. I think it was really special. Benjamin Rush, who signed the declaration, he helped ratify the Constitution. He served in the first three presidential administrations. His resume is, is astounding. It continues to go. But Benjamin Rush also talked about the Constitution. He said, I do not believe that the Constitution was the offspring of divine inspiration. But I'm as perfectly satisfied that it is as much the work of divine providence as any of the miracles recorded in the Old and New Testament. So he's explaining, I'm not saying the Constitution is like the Bible that's inspired by God in that sense, but I would argue this is as much as of a miracle as the parting of the Red Sea, as the feeding of the 5,000, that this happened, this, this, God did something here. The founding fathers not only knew who God was, they gave God credit for what happened in America. And this is, again, it's what you find when you read their writings. Today, people read from different professors or, or these, these different online articles or somebody posted on Facebook something, and we think, well, they must not have been religious. The Freedom From Religion Foundation said, nope, we're not supposed to have God in America. We believe so much nonsense because we don't know what they actually wrote and what they actually said, but we used to understand this. In fact, historians used to talk about this. For example, you have guys like Stephen Caldwell, who was a guy writing, writing about the history of the Constitution. He said it was the spirit of true Christianity that the hospitality and blessings of the United States were offered to all the world. All were invited to enjoy it. So, so what we did was for all people to come and, and enjoy the blessings of America, which we still want people to celebrate and enjoy today. The Christian men of that day intended that the nation should continue to be a Christian nation. They did not place Christianity beneath nor over their political institutions. Rather, it was to be the atmosphere which they breathed who administered them. It was the source of the inspiration, and they sought to make the blessing available for human advantage. He concluded this thought by saying these institutions and laws were to be the instruments of Christian men for the good of the whole human family. Now, this is what historians used to recognize about the foundation of which our nation was built specifically with the Constitution, but notice he says that Christianity was the atmosphere in which all of this was done. Why does that matter? Because as you look at the nation, right, an atmosphere is something that, if you remember from science, I mean, we, we've kind of studied this, we've learned about this, we've maybe heard some, some things about this. In our atmosphere, one of the many miracles of creation, the reason that we, we can go through some of the flaws and, and some of the evolutionary concepts, some of the thoughts of what's out there, but the fact that God hung the earth in a certain place where we're just close enough to get warmth, to any closer we'd burn up, any further away we'd free. Like, I mean, the, so much detail, and then the atmosphere was perfect for humans to grow and develop and function. Like, so many amazing things about this, but here's the point, is the argument was, or the, the statement he made was Christianity was the atmosphere. If we tried to live on Mars, we would not survive right now. The atmosphere is not conducive for life. Our constitution is suffocating because when you try to do it without Christianity, it just doesn't work. This, this is the reality, right? People say, we need to change the Constitution. The problem, I would argue, isn't the Constitution. It's the hearts of men, right? It's, it's humanity that is flawed and needs a Savior. And I'll get to more of this later. But Jedediah Morris was a historian explaining some of these notions about the Constitution. And here's what he said. To the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe the degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoy. In proportion as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished, and so when you diminish Christianity, this is what's going to happen, he says. In the same proportion will the people of that nation recede from blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism. Now, just think about that. 
If you remove Christianity, you lose freedom and you go to despotism. It's interesting that every communist nation is secular. They're not Christian. They have no freedom and there's despotism, which is interesting, right? When you remove Christianity, that's kind of what you see happen in nations. He continued, all efforts made to destroy the foundations of our holy religion ultimately tend to the subversion also of our political freedom and happiness. The same people that are against Christianity are trying to remove freedom and happiness in America. It's absolutely true. We can cover that more later. He concluded, whenever the pillars of Christianity shall be overthrown, our present Republican forms of government and all the blessings which flow from them must fall with them. What he said is it hinges on Christianity. And, and let me finish with a thought from John Adams. John Adams explained that our Constitution only worked one way. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Why? Because we believe in giving freedom to people. But freedom only works if you have moral and religious people. Because if you give freedom to criminals... What do they do? Criminal things, right? So, so freedom really only works if we've taught a moral foundation and framework of how to function in society. And when you remove Christianity, you no longer have the moral foundation to explain to a culture how to be free. Christianity has, is what has allowed America to be the freest, most prosperous nation in the history of the world. But to the same extent that Christianity is diminished, we will lose a lot of the liberty and blessings we have enjoyed because the only reason we've enjoyed them is because of Christianity. Because we've learned we're supposed to love our neighbors ourselves. We do unto others as we'd have them do unto us. We don't steal. There's some basic concepts of Christianity that now it's not a given in culture anymore. Right? We, we, we don't see the same elements of this, but this is what you see when you look back to the guys who gave us the Constitution, who gave us the Declaration, who birthed America. Now, a lot of people today point back and go, well, they were terrible people. I am not taking away from the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? It, let, me, let me just preface. I think one of the things that we make a mistake is anytime we talk about people or nations or individuals— Sometimes we start with a flawed perspective, not recognizing, nope, everybody's jacked up and needs a savior. Right? That should be our starting place. But here's what's significant. If we stopped with, because the argument a lot of people say today is, whoa, 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 whoa. we can't say any good thing about them because they did bad things. Let me, let, me, let me unfold a thought for you. Okay? As a Christian... King David, one of the most amazing worshipers and warriors in our faith. Amazing. In fact, where else does the Bible say this was someone after God's own heart? Right? But if you read the story of David, do you know about Amnon? Who, that was a dude who had a crush on a sister, Right? calls sister in, rape sister. Absalom finds out. Absalom kills Amnon. Absalom also a son. Absalom then decides he wants to take the throne from his dad, right? Remember how that happens? Tree, cotton hair, javelins, he's done, okay? Then you have Adonijah. Adonijah also tries to take the throne from his father. The Bible, when explaining Adonijah, says, and David had never once corrected him. What kind of father... Never once told, hey, hey, son, whoa, whoa, we don't do that. Never once corrected him? I would argue David was, if not the worst father in the Bible, he's at least runner-up for the worst father in the Bible. Okay? And then, right, remember the time when kings go to war and David stayed? And from his balcony, he looked out and saw this woman of unusual beauty bathing, Bathsheba, calls her in, they have an affair. She gets pregnant. He goes, oh my gosh, what do I do? Okay, uh, bring the, right, and remember the whole story with Uriah, right? Tries to get him home, gets him drunk, nothing works. Says, okay, let's just send him to the front line till all the troops retreat, leave him by himself. Problems. David has this dude bumped off, right? He has him murdered. How in the world can we ever celebrate David? Here's how. 
because we don't celebrate the sin in David's life. We celebrate how God used David and did amazing things through David. In history, I don't celebrate the sin in a founding father's life. I can look back with moral clarity from the Bible and go, nope, that was wrong, and that was wrong, and that was wrong. And yet God still used these individuals to do something so special that the world has never seen anything like what we have enjoyed. And here's the bottom line, is one of the things we know from Scripture, the Bible tells us, uh, oh, by the way, I got ahead of myself. Today we hear that none of, none of the founding fathers believed in God. They weren't religious. In the Constitution, there's a group of professors who actually wrote a book called The Godless Constitution. In this book, it was written by two professors from, uh, well, actually, Kramnik and Moore are the two guys that wrote it. But these two professors have, have written several books. And they've taught in a couple different places. But these two professors make this argument that none of the founding fathers wanted God to be part of our nation, that they, they thought God was a bad idea. I mean, the book is... It's just an utterly ridiculous read for lots of reasons, but I read the book because I wanted to know, well, well what do you think is the reason, right? Because I'm open to hearing both sides. That's fine. But in the midst of hearing both sides, I want to know what's true, not just what somebody's feelings, thoughts, or opinions are, right? So if we want to know what's true, at the back of their book, you have a note on sources. This is where you would put your footnotes. The problem is, Here's what they said about their footnotes. We have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. <laughs> Do you know the leading critics against the founding fathers, against the fact that, that there was faith in America or that, that we never intended to have secular institutions? Because the founding fathers did believe in a separation of church and state, just not the way we have it today. They believed the government should never control religion and tell religion what to do, but they didn't believe you shouldn't be a Christian in government. They had presidential prayer proclamations calling the nation to pray. I think that violated separation of church and state, except the founding fathers are the ones who did it. The point is that so often the critics, they only have their thoughts, feelings, and opinions. It's not rooted and grounded in truth. And there's only two or three examples they can point to, which doesn't overwhelm the majority of what the founding fathers said, did, and the way they behaved. But the point is, this is the accusations that are out there. They're not grounded in, in historical fact and reality, but this is the way I want to close. One of the things we know from Scripture, Psalms 33, 12, says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There's a reason America has been the most blessed, prosperous, stable nation in the history of the world. It's because we built on the right foundation. It's not because we've always been godly and religious. In fact, America is not that dissimilar from the story of the Israelites. Really messed up people in a lot of areas, made a lot of really bad decisions at moments. And yet, even in our nation's history, I would point out that every atrocity we've ever done in America, and we've done some, we've done some really bad things in our nation's history, we have. But every bad thing we've ever done do you know the reason we stopped doing those bad things? Was because there were Christian pastors and leaders who stood up and said, hey, that's not what we should be doing. God wants us doing something different. And our nation put a stop to those atrocities long before any other nation did. In fact, one of the things that the big accusations that, well, what about slavery? Yeah. America has a, a massive stain when it comes to slavery. There's no doubt. However, in the time of the founding fathers, what nation had ended slavery? None. In fact, America was the second nation in the history of the world to end slavery. Now, we should have been first because we're winners and we try to be first, right? But we were the first nation to outlaw the slave trade. We were the second nation to abolish slavery. It does not take away the fact what we did was very, very bad. However, when you judge things out of the context of history— we, we, we don't always understand. And by the way, why did slavery end in America? Well, we could go through the list of pastors who were leading the movement. In fact, in, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk for a moment about the Reverend Charles Finney. He was a leader in the Second Great Awakening. He had a Bible college. If you were a student in his Bible college, he required you to work on the Underground Railroad. Th this is where Christians and pastors were helping lead the charge to end the problems. See, our nation, like every nation, every nation will always have problems because every nation will always have people. <laughs> but 
Where our nation was able to solve problems was you had Christians stand up and say, we shouldn't be doing this. Whether it was the Reverend Frederick Douglass, right? Former slave, was freed, was fighting in slavery. You, you always had Christians saying, this is what the Bible says. Our nation, every time we've started going the wrong direction, Christians have helped correct course and get us back. And here's the challenge for us, is our nation for sure needs some help and direction in correcting course. There's no doubt about it. But this is something that should never discourage us because what's impossible for man is possible with God. And we want to be people that God uses to get the job done. We want to be the ones when the Israelites were going to go into Canaan and they sent each, they, they got a leader from each twi- tribe. So, so 12, 12 leaders going to spy out the land. As they go in, right, they come back. Remember Joshua and Caleb? They were the only ones that said, oh yeah, we can totally do this. The other 10 leaders were like, it's so hard, we're never going to make it. (laughs) Well, guess who didn't make it, right? God is always looking for vessels he can use. And I'm just telling you, I always want to be someone that says, you know what? There There are giants in that land. Joshua and Caleb knew they were giants. There's giants in the lands. But God has called us, so we should do it. This is where we need to finish. Our nation's history is full of every time we've started going the wrong way, Christians have stepped up and made a difference. Uh, There's so much more we can say about this. In fact, if you guys want to know more, I'd encourage you to check out our website, wallbuilders.com. We also have several cool resources, a few of them that are here. Um, One of them is the Founder's Bible. For more than 30 years, we've been studying the Founding Fathers. And I showed just a few examples of how the Founding Fathers quoted or referenced the Bible today. But this Bible is full of thousands of examples. In fact, the reason we did this is uh, we wanted to to show how the founding fathers used the Bible to shape America. So as you read the Bible, which I encourage every Christian, read the Bible cover to cover. Really good thing to do. If you've read it cover to cover, do it again. It's a good thing to do a second and a third and a fourth time, right? Keep doing it. Make every year. Every year, just read the Bible cover to cover. It's a great idea. But if you want to see how the Bible shaped America, as you go through this, when you come to verses— we put the founding father's quote by the verse they're quoting, and we put a footnote by that quote so you can literally see how they're quoting the Bible to shape America. It's a really cool way to read through and study the Bible. It's also in digital form. You can get an app. Um, and then we have this precarious moment, which is a, a newer product dealing with some, some major issues in our nation and, and giving historical context, biblical context, and some practical solutions of how we can solve some of these problems. So this is really one of the best books to get activated. What can I do to make a difference? That book's got a lot of good answers. We also are all over social media. If you guys want to see more, um, we do short videos every week telling some stories from history, some cool people. But let me close with a verse and then we're taking a break. So in Proverbs 14, 34, the Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is reproached to any people righteousness, the Bible says is what it's exalts a nation. I love that we are in an era where somebody wants to make America great again, right? Now, you might disagree with some of the tweets because the Lord knows I do, but I am so grateful that somebody cares about trying to make America great. But here's what I can tell you. You can never make her great again if you don't know what made her great in the first place. And the Bible says this is what makes a nation great which means that Christians are the only ones that can be the answer because heathens do not promote righteousness. It's only Christians. We are the answer to a world and culture in need. As Christians, we have to stand up and make a difference. Thank you guys so much for letting me share. And I'm turning it over. I think Tony somewhere. No, maybe there. Okay.